Yes, sir. Right, morning, morning. Welcome, Wisdom Chats. Friday, the twelfth of March. Uh, I think uh, Lee, not not Thursday, the twelfth. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we've had some challenges with our emails of late. Um, that's what happens, I suppose, from time to time. But uh, yeah, people and animals, I think, is what we're chatting about this morning. The interactions between uh, between humans and and animals, their animals, other people's animals, wild animals, uh, or just you know, other human animals, I suppose, could, could also be the direction we take here. Yeah? But uh, Lee, where were your thoughts going with this topic? I think we, you know, we had lots of stories throughout the week of, of various animal type type stories. And um, it just, it, it, I thought it would be good just to spend some time thinking a little bit more about it. And I, I think I'm fascinated that animals engage with us as much as they do um, because I, I can't help but feel we are are less than useless in their lives um, we you know what is what value do we bring to them other than um, mostly being a a, a predator <laughs> and and yet um even wild animals, and maybe that's especially where I find it so amazing, is that, uh, you know, you were talking about the, the, bo, bo, the chimp, I don't know, I can't, <laughs> the bow chimp. Bonobo, bonobo. bonobo. The bonobo, bonobo. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, accompanying this, this lady and, and, and seeing himself maybe as her companion or as a, as a god, or um, there was something intriguing um, about this person and what they were doing that he participated. And I just find that fascinating. And, and it came up again in the um, octopus teacher, uh, which I think you might have seen now, Edward, we recommended it a while ago. And mm -hmm. uh, that again, this was more than just a um, a creature paying attention or even being curious about this human being, it, it grew to affection, you know, it, because there's no, it, and then maybe that's, we may be anthropomorphizing, but I just can't help but feel like there was actions that this octopus took that didn't serve its evolutionary or survival um, behavior. So sitting, you know, sort of lying on his chest and, or, in, you know, just kind of, there was this sense of connection, of affection, of, um, and, and I just think that's, that's extraordinary. <clears throat> uh, and then we've just recently seen this movie, um, and I think I might have mentioned it yesterday, Penguin Bloom, um, that is, is based on the true story of this uh, lady who uh, had an accident and paralyzed uh, and was really struggling. She had three little boys, rambunctious Australian Aussie kids, <laughs> and she couldn't play with them. She was a very active person, very active mom, and, and just felt like who, who, who she was and, and what she did didn't make sense anymore and then this injured bird came into their lives and and this magpie built a relationship with all of the family but especially with the with with the mom where you know he, he, he would sit on her head um and um and and she fell off her wheelchair at one point and and he goes and he he find, you know he he raises the alarm and um, so I understand domestication and all of that, but wild animals and this relationship that they're willing to engage with. And I think back to the early days of, of human beings building relationships with wild horses, um, with wild dogs, um, and that uh, it just to me is extraordinary. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, I think the last thing maybe, the other thing that I found 
interesting is how how because of some of this anthropomorphizing that we treat our pets not as the animals that they are <laughs> that even as domesticated as they are they still are animals um, and and that's why we have these pet psychologists which seems like a <laughs> but the psychology and I when you listen to the it is the psychology is not for the pet the pet is perfectly fine <laughs> it's for the owner um, who's who's forgotten that or hasn't realized that you, you must treat the animal as its instincts dictate um, and, uh, and not as some, and, and I hear people talk about their fur babies all the time. Um, and I, I think there is a, and there is this inordinate love that people have for their pets. Um, and, and that's a whole different topic. Um, I, I, and I, I mean, I have, have had wonderful pets in my life and had wonderful relations, you know, connections with them. Um, but I certainly have had friends who've taken it to, you know, what to me seems like an incredible um, level of, of adoration and um, besottedness. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, that's, I think, let me, let me leave it there. Love to hear what you say, Edward. Great, thanks, Lee. So, Ed, what are the pets in your life? <laughs> yeah, I find this quite a strange subject, actually. And I think, um, yeah, Lee said I'm vegan because I want to preserve animals. That's not, that's actually not why I'm a vegan. Um, vegans about respect for, for for animals and and not not exploiting them. If I wanted more animals, I'd probably promote the beef and dairy industry because the biomass of domesticated animals, or domesticated cattle, should I say, exceeds that of all wild mammals, which I find absolutely staggering. And, and when you think of the fact that that's probably mostly beef cattle, maybe goat, a few goats, but mainly beef cattle, what does that say for biodiversity? You know, so I think it's a very dangerous situation. Um, but yeah, I, I think, and also you know, the global population of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians has plunged by 68% between 1970 and, and 2016. So, you know, we've had a huge impact on the animal population. And they're nice, those little stories about the chimp and the woman and and that thing about, the, I watched that video about the, um, the badger escaping all the time. What, what I found interesting was, was why did the badger always get caught again? Um, and, and those sort of films, I never totally believe them because I think they show what we want to see and not the whole story. Um, and I do think we exploit animals, you know, and that chimpanzee was a, was, was a thing. It's not its natural way of being. You know, it, it, it's a it, it's a, a group animal so it wasn't in its group and i think we should just leave them alone basically to get on with it you know and yeah you you, you do get people that kind of really invest a lot in their pets don't you i remember we we we, we got a um couple of young uh, springer spaniel pup. well i did my wife got a couple of um, young springer spaniel puppies and and when they're being weaned, you feed them on rice pudding. And the best rice pudding you can get in a tin is ambro ambrosia creamed rice. And my two puppies got ambrosia creamed rice. And then one day we had uh, rice pudding for, for, for our dessert. And it was a, a cheap uh, supermarket own brand, which I thought was really interesting. You know? And a lot of people do invest a lot of time and energy into their pets and almost treat them like children. And I just find that so disrespectful from, from my point of view. And, and I think you know, dogs and, and cats are a special thing because you can't rewild them now. You know, there's, there's, there's been so many years of breeding, crossbreeding, 
domestication, there is no way you can rewild those dogs now. Um, but I think really we should just leave things in the wild as they are. And, and when animals do have interactions with us, they're normally not to the animal's benefit. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we always used to love going down to the, to the river to feed the ducks. And we used to feed them bread, which is the worst thing you can really do with a duck because it fills it up and it doesn't get a good diet. So it becomes ill. Um, it's gone even further. I don't know whether you've seen any films of Midway Island where the albatross chicks die. Um, it's, it's an island thousands of miles from anywhere else. It used to be a, a, a sort of refueling base in the war for, for, for the American um, planes. And the, the middle of the island is it, it, just covered in plastic. And you wonder, well, how did it get to the middle of the island? And what happens is albatrosses breed there. And, and the albatrosses build their nest and the little chicks hatch and then albatrosses scoop up fish from the sea. And then they digest them, regurgitate them and shove them down their kid's throat. And all these dead chicks have starved to death because their stomachs are full of plastic. And we've done that. We've done that. The albatross is busy trying to do what it, what it wants to do. And it's killing its chicks because of us. And, and some of the stuff that comes that you find in their stomachs are things like um, those little plastic lighters that people use, the disposable cigarette lighters. They throw them away in the streets. They get washed into a storm drain, into a river, out to sea, and then in the most sort of isolated place in the world, they pop up and, and kill an albatross. Or even what I find even worse is you get um, plastic wadding and shotgun pellets. So some, I shall not swear, bloke decides he's going to shoot a grouse in a grouse moor in Scotland and he's paid a thousand pounds to blast this bird out of the sky that's got no chance whatsoever because it's been bred specially to be shot. He might pick his cartridge up, but the shot, the, the plastic wadding has gone, you know, quite a long way away. That never gets picked up. It gets washed into a river, down into the sea, out into the um, Atlantic, the birds scoops it up thinking it's a nice little fish, job done. So I think, you know, our, our interaction with um, the animal world is, is shocking, either in the fact that we exploit them and we've exploited them really badly in some ways. I mean, it's not as bad now as it used to be, you know, the way donkeys were treated, the way bears were used for fighting, the way, way cocks were used, you know, chickens were used for fighting all that sort of stuff. And actually, you know, the way we treated, um, and this is another thing that really fascinates me, um, the French quite like eating horse. The English, that is a complete no-no. What's the difference between a horse and a cow? And, and in the First World War, loads and loads and loads of horses were taken over to Europe to, 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 to use to fight in the war. And when the war was over, it was felt it wasn't worth bringing them back. So they left them in Europe and they became cheap food. That's why the French eat horse and the Belgian eat horse as well. But we don't. And the other day, a horse died, um, a, a, a racehorse died. And the trainer, it died of a heart attack while it was training. The trainer sat on it while he made a phone call on his mobile. And that caused an absolute uproar. And I thought, well, that's funny, isn't it? You can cram these poor things in a, in a, in a lorry and you know, send poor cows in a lorry, send them across the channel of France to be slaughtered, all that sort of thing. And you don't mind about it. Some guy sits on a dead carcass and you get a bit uppity. <laughs> and, and, those same people that are pay, paying a thousand pounds to shoot grouse or shoot pheasant will probably also donate to save the rhino. I never understand that. Save the rhino. And, and, and in the UK, we've got a badger population, which 
people say it spreads TB into cattle. So the idea is you cull all the badgers. Now, the science behind it isn't very strong, but of course there is a vaccine you can use to vaccinate the cattle. But the problem is you can't then tell whether the cattle's been vaccinated or had TB. And a lot of countries won't then buy the meat. So it's not a welfare issue, it's a money issue. But so we, we have this thing, you know, save the rhino or save the tiger, cull the badger, slaughter the cow. How do you work that out? Where's that logic? And when I talk about not eating meat, people say, well, it's natural to eat meat. I don't remember in my history lesson learning that the, the Maasai or, or the Hansa tribe marinated their, their, their choice cups of meat in red wine and then roasted it in an oven for a couple of hours and then served it with some mustard. They just ate the whole blooming animal. So I think if you are going to say it's natural to eat meat, eat it naturally, because we now have a choice as to what we eat. And, and my choice is to eat vegetables. Um, it's not natural because we would have eaten meat, you know, uh, uh, the Hansa tribe in, in Tanzania, which I think is the last true hunter gatherer, they eat porcupine, they eat vegetables, they eat yams, that sort of stuff. That's what we should be eating. But we've got a choice and we choose to actually have more domesticated cattle than there are wild animals in the world. So I choose to eat carrots. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, look, it, it is it, it is uh, interesting. I, you know, I think this concept of of uh, how far we've moved from from nature has, has sort of strung across a couple of of these chats during the course of the week, and uh, and and yeah, I suppose in essence again, this is really what we're talking about. Um, you know, how far we've moved away from what is natural. I mean, you use the word natural. You know. So, so many times there, and, and I think it's absolutely correct. You know, what is what is natural? What is a natural interaction between between species? You know, whether it's whether it's human and cattle, or human and rhino, or human and lion, or elephant, or whatever the case might be. You know, what is what is a natural interaction between between those different uh, those different species? So, yeah, and it is interesting how that that wheel is slowly turning. Um, you know, my, my concern is that it's probably turning too slowly. Um, you know, the drive to go back to to what is determined sustainable and organic, and 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 those uh, those nice buzzwords that are bandied around in, in the uh, in the in the production marketplace, um, because any form of monoculture is is, is obviously not uh, not a healthy thing for the planet, whether it's monoculture of animals or monoculture of soybean it doesn't really matter it's monoculture um you, know, you think of the uh, the huge plantations that have been put up around south africa uh, for the production of wooden paper you know as a monoculture that destroys ecosystems so so once again there our interaction you know with uh, with nature uh, per se is has created a problem for for us uh, going forward so yeah, I don't think this is really intended the topic to go, but it's an interesting direction that it's that, it, that it's taken. Uh, but I do find I do find oh, and we lost Lee. Okay, I wonder what happened there? Maybe her power went off again or something. I think she um, was trying to do something by the looks of it. Maybe pressed the wrong button or something. <laughs> or maybe it, maybe a battery went. Yeah. Yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, it is. It is. I find it really interesting, but I also find, and, and I, I agree with you to some extent. You know, these clips that we see on YouTube and things like that, um, they, 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 did, you know, they are edited to to portray a particular um, message that somebody is trying to portray. But I do find, I do find them still interesting because it does show things that, you know, whether it's a learned behavior or or, a, or an instinctive behavior or something like that. It's a, it's, it's something that that is unexpected let's put it that way um and uh i mean i, I popped popped up two two other clips there in, in the chat there um and uh, seen a number of uh, uh recent uh, stories about about human interaction with with various uh sea creatures of one form or another but sharks specifically which is which i found quite interesting uh, and there again you would think 
you know you've got a you've got an apex predator on one side and an apex predator on the other side and uh, and they appear to, they appear to be interacting quite civilly <laughs> let's put it that way uh, so yeah that's uh unless he comes back as me yeah <laughs> welcome back lee but I think it's interesting, you know, you've, I mean, you do get beneficial relationships between animals and animals. And we are an animal because you think of those little birds that sit on the back of uh, rhinos and things. Yeah. Or you think of those fish that swim with sharks yeah. and, and the shark leaves them alone. And there's also some, some anemones where they tolerate the fish because the fish gets protection and it brings stuff in. So there are mm. those relationships. And Symbiotic. Just, yeah. yeah. And I just love the way that animals, particularly birds, adapt and they just get on with it, you know, because uh, in, in the, say, in the Northeast, they wiped out most of the places where the birds would nest naturally. So they now nest on the buildings because they're just like cliffs. Mm. And it's the same all over the place, isn't it? And, and you find you know, foxes in, in this country are now more common in the town than in the country because they can go into people's dustbins and have a good yeah. eat. And just live in their gardens you know so it's, it's interesting how animals adapt but but i do think most of the time when they uh, when they interact with us they come off worse i i, I think so in, in those kinds of interactions and adaptions that you're talking about uh, again you know clearly are, are not necessarily natural and not necessarily long-term beneficial to those animals because they could be uh, eating or living in environments that are that are dangerous uh, or ultimately going to be dangerous to to them because they they're ingesting things that are simply not part of their normal their normal eating diet mm -hmm. um so yeah i think it's uh, yeah I, I do find it interesting you know i mean one of one of course one of the course of the big challenges here we have we have locally um is uh, the, the you know we you spoke about rhinos and, and things like that is because we've artificially contain these animals in game parks doesn't really matter how big they are they then need to be managed mm. um, and and the management becomes quite a quite a hot potato in, in in some circles for example i mean in the kruger we've got a big problem with the elephants uh, you know in, in certain areas of the kruger they're totally destroying the environment because they are it's overpopulated now uh, with with elephant um, and uh, and so you know how do how do you manage that process? So you know they announced they're going to do some culling, and of course everybody, well not everybody, certain sectors of the of the population throw up their hands in absolute horror and say no, you absolutely can't do that and create a furor and, and fuss around it. And and so you know management says, well, what would you like us to do then? You know um, if we if we can't actually manage the population, no, no you must relocate them. So well. Who's going to pay for the relocation? You know, uh, to relocate one elephant is is you know this takes a significant amount of manpower and money to actually do. And and there's some people who are throwing up their hands saying you can't cull them, aren't putting their hands in their pockets to say, well, here's some money to relocate them. Um, so it, it you know it it puts puts those who are trying to manage that interaction with those animals in a very very difficult position because now the environment's being destroyed. Um, so it's compromising all the other animals in the area, um, but their hands are being tied in terms of dealing with the problem. Uh, and you can't simply open the open the fences and let them let them return to their natural migratory paths because guess what they're going to get killed anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the, yeah, those 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 challenges we've created for 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 ourselves and for the animals, and and we certainly need to find elegant ways of, of dealing with the problems. And I'm not sure that there are too many uh, elegant ways left, unfortunately. Um, so, Lee, you disappeared, you came back, you froze, you're back with us live now. <laughs> it was a the joys, in your system. The joys yeah, of, yeah. of load shedding. So, so this, is actually, this is actually what I wanted to um, pick up um, is vicious cycles. How do we break, or what options do we have when it comes to vicious cycles? Um, and we, we're currently, uh, and I'll just give one example here in South Africa at the moment. We've just had a tragedy in... Um, 
think you just dis disappeared into the depths well, of the ocean. Well, there universities where a student was killed the, uh, during protests. Okay. Well, I think let's just leave it at that and I'll, I'll pick it up on Monday. So I think that's the point is vicious cycles. Let's talk about the solutions. Okay, great. Thanks, yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. Hopefully not a vicious cycle over the weekend for you, but otherwise have a good one and, uh, and we'll see you on Monday morning. Cheers, Matt. Good. Bye. Bye.